Hey, what's up, YouTube? You're looking at the new Canon PowerShot G3X. Now, this is Canon's premium point and shoot camera, and it sits above the G7X and behind the G1X. It has a one inch sensor, the same sensor or a similar uh, uh, size sensor at least um, to the G7X, but slightly smaller than the 1.5 inch sensor of the G1X and G1X Mark II. This is different from the G7X mainly, um, mainly I would say among other things is that it has a more reach of its lens. So this guy has a 25x zoom lens and that would again be a USB of this device in general. And this lens ranges right from 24mm till 600mm in 35mm equivalent. And that, that amount of reach with optical image stabilization throughout on a one inch sensor. And we might just have a winner here. But let's see, there are other things uh, around here which we will discuss during this review video. And the Canon PowerShot G3X cost about 60,000, but that's the MRP. So you might get it for slightly less with your local vendor or online, or it cost about thousand dollars in the US market. Again, you would get it for about $900 uh, in some popular online stores, or might be even less on eBay or maybe used one or amazon.com, which that uh, puts it in the price territory of um, in, actually in between two of its direct competitors one is the panasonic fz1000 another is the um, sony rx10 uh, all the three have one in sensor the rx10 has the least amount of zoom it has 24 till 200 mm zoom but the thing is it has a constant aperture of 2.8 so it has a very fast aperture throughout the reach. The Panasonic FZ1000 has slightly more uh, zoom range starting from 25 till uh, 400. So you have roughly about double the zoom range, but the aperture is variable. Not much though, 2.8 till 4. This one has 24 till 600 m. So uh, this actually has the most amount of zoom range, much more than even the FZ100. But the catch is that it has a variable aperture and the max aperture at the tele end is 5.6. So it starts with 2.8, but you get to a pretty slow 5.6 at 600 mm. The interesting thing is we need to see how long the fast aperture lasts. So we're going to see here how long f by 2.8 lasts and when exactly it starts to move the aperture and for uh, and before how long it gets to 5.6. And that's an important factor. A uh, very very important factor rather because although you know that uh, this one will start at f by 2.8 but then that does not mean that it has a great reach as much as the Sony RX10 or maybe even a uh, little less to justify the price or maybe to justify the quality of the lens the fast uh, the light capture capability of the lens so this is really really important how long f by 2.8 lasts let's see it at 24 mm we see it's f by 2.8 and i'm just going to switch on the display again then you'll see i'll just slightly zoom out and see it suddenly it got to 3.5 so this one it's not no more at 2.8 so even I think we are at about 35 to 40 and now we are at 50 and you already got to f by 4.0 that's the max we are at the aperture uh, aperture priority mode and you can see it cannot decrease the aperture number so max aperture is f by 4 so at 50 you already got to f by 4 at about 35 you already got to 3.5 so the 2.8 f by 2.8 that fast aperture you only get that advantage mainly between 24 till 35 fish focal length so that's very very less now compare that to the rx10 of constant f by 2.8 um, all the way to 24 till 200 so if you need a lens uh, that's extremely fast and great in low light with very good shallow depth of field across the focal range this might not be the one or at least the rx10 uh, would be better than this one because it does not have as much as reach as this one but still you have a very fast lens uh, more low light capable lens plus um, a lens that will give you um, you know shallow depth of field 
at across the focal length plus again there's a very um, you know good advantage of having a constant aperture whenever you're shooting a video if you zoom in or out your exposure is not going to change because your aperture remains the same that's a great thing so you won't uh, you know suddenly you know while you zoom in you won't suddenly see a darker video mainly because the aperture the the maximum aperture got larger like this so here if you start to zoom in let's say you started a video at 24 you get an f by 2.8 aperture um, great light so even under a little less light you'd get a good video light enough but as you zoom in you'd see a darker and darker video because your maximum aperture starts to increase i hope you get the point so we'll just go ahead and see when it gets to 5.6 so at about just over 70 it's 4.5 and here it's 5 so i would say at about 100 it's 5 it's already about 5 at 100 i think at about 150 it gets to 5.6 maybe 150 to 170 so uh, think of a lens that says 2.5 2.8 till 5.6 but it has all the way till 600 and this lens has 5.6 it has achieved 5.6 or reach that's not an achievement anyway it has reached 5.6 at almost 150 to 170 of the focal length we still have all the way up to 600 to go so all the fast apertures before 5.6 already finished by the time we've reached 150 to 160 that's a big disadvantage of this lens uh, so you have to really see these kind of things whenever you have a variable aperture and that actually explains why this camera despite of having such a large zoom is a compact more compact than the panasonic and the sony one because because it does not have that fast aperture across the length so it could make a smaller or lighter body or maybe more compact body another reason this one looks more compact than the sony and the panasonic one is because this did away with the EVF. There is no built-in EVF. Panasonic and Sony both come with EVF. Now those who have used EVF and EVF has its own advantages over the LCD. It's much faster and also it's EVF generally has um, you know much greater resolution. So EVF is definitely um, you know very desirable if you have one so those to have the EVF built in this one does not have it but it comes with an uh, optional uh, EVF but when you add the cost of the EVF to it that kind of exceeds the cost of even the Sony one so that's again another advantage for those who use EVF so you get a great reach here but not so fast of a lens plus you do not have an EVF so you have to take these things into account so long reach is definitely an advantage another great advantage of this camera is that this weighs 730 gram well that's not the advantage but that weight is because this guy is almost all metal plus it's weather seal not like the panasonic one panasonic is not weather seal at all the sony one is well weather seal but uh, well we cannot compare how different the weather sealing on this one with the sony one but this one is all metal and totally weather sealed so even under rain um, you know you're working outdoor for extensive period of time dust rain mud no problem you can use this camera there as well uh, so let's go ahead and check out some button layouts and all stuff first so you have that massive zoom you see it says 2.8 till 5.6 25x zoom also comes with optical image stabilization throughout the zoom range the canon logo the g3x logo and then you have the mics there and your autofocus assist lamp you have a great grip i like the grip in general uh, plus you see the is elements making sound there yeah so at first you might think that the lens is loose you might freak out but do not freak out those are the is elements or the image stabilization elements floating inside the lens so it's gonna be like that but i think they could have placed them better to make less sound and it's kind of uh, looks really rickety and kind of the lens might come out that's not the case though uh, then you have the manual focus button and you also have what you call a focus assist 
when you tap this button if you're zoomed in when you tap this button it will tell you exactly what part of the scene uh, you have zoomed in on top you have uh, there's a shutter release button the zoom lever which is not very smooth kind of at times goes out a bit so you'll have to um, be you know you have to get used to um, uh, for a smooth operation of this one and then you have the command dial and then the video recording button you expose the compensation scale the power button and then the shooting mode dial your accessory hot shoe you also have a flash a good thing is that you can uh, use it as a bounce flash as well that's another good thing on the back side you have a brilliant screen that's one of the high point of this camera 3.2 inch TFT screen now this screen goes right up so you can actually use this camera to take a selfie as well and when we switch on you see yeah, of course I have all the exposures wrong but that's I'm just showing you so it starts from 24 so you have a pretty decent field of view so you know you can really use this camera for vlogging that's a great thing outdoor vlogging and then it goes about 45% uh, 45 degree maybe so you can also use this camera uh, you can have this camera over your head to click from an angle above so that's how the, uh, this goes this this part looks quite solid but you have a cord coming out here so you have to be really careful this is just a strip and it might just snap off if you use that uh, too harshly and then you have some buttons out there I love these buttons I love the feel of the metal buttons they give amazing tactile feedback everything and, and um, another good thing is that you have ample customizable button you can go here uh, that's customizable then actually a lot of these things are customized you can customize this thing I'll come back to that uh, just in a bit so here you have all your necessary audio inputs the mic input the headphone input on this side you have the um, remote input you have the charging input that's mini port mini USB port and then you have a full size HDMI ports good thing below you have the tripod mount and space for your battery as well as the SD card the battery is I think it's about let's see 920 mAh battery so not much yeah. so that's about the controls and dials of the stuff now coming back to the best part that I like I love this ring it's very very smooth and kind of it's a pleasure to actually move and whenever you can customize this to have multiple functions in multiple shooting modes but whenever you use this I, I love these smooth rings So let's go ahead and check out the user interface in bit and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how uh, you can customize those anyway. So that's the display. You can toggle the display right from there. You see? You can have, and you can also um, have what you want to see uh, set in the menu. And that's one button. That's a one touch Wi Fi button because this guy comes with Wi Fi as well as NFC. That's the NFC area. Let's quickly go to the menu. And good thing is you do not have a very power shot kind of a menu rather you have uh, there a menu layout that's more like their DSLR so if you're used to the Canon DSLR you might find this very easy and comfortable to use so you have both raw and uh, JPEG support of course and the touch screen is amazing you can have shooting info display customization you have reverse display and then review some of the other things you, you can also have touch shutter off on so whenever you touch the shutter will take a photo I have it off generally so you have one shot and servo servo will be uh, servo autofocus system is um, you know it's kind of the camera will decide the camera if the uh, if the subject is still then it's autofocus will be in the still mode and then a single autofocus mode basically and whenever the subject starts moving it will move or it will shift to the continuous autofocus mode one point autofocus or smile and tracking kind of autofocus and if you have one point autofocus uh, enable you can have autofocus frame size small or a large so that's the that's I have the small selected you can also have a larger one so continuous autofocus on that's great for videos and then you have manual 
uh, point zoom so that you can zoom the center part part of the display to have better assist um, in manual focus to help that you also have a manual focus peaking button there and you can actually assign the colors i love the red because red is very prominent very loud and it invariably will tell you in the frame whenever uh, it achieved focus and then i settings and bracketing it also comes with a built-in and filter and that's a great that's a great deal actually specifically when you consider it's very uh you know very modest shutter speed of only uh, a maximum shutter speed of only one by two thousand second so whenever you're shooting in broad daylight you have you do not have much flexibility with the shutter speed only one by two thousand mm so if you're zoomed in and shooting you also do not have that flexibility with the aperture so you pretty much will have to let um you know much of the light come inside the lens you also only have a minimum iso of 125 so at that time your nd filter can help because nd filter will reduce the amount of light coming in from the lens so that might help but still i just wished um the shutter speed the maximum shutter speed was slightly more at least one by um you know one by four thousandth of a second but still that's the way it is so you have some of the other menus or menu items i can simply go here and check out the video systems and all and my favorite menu and then you have the quick settings menu you can also press this or simply press this because it's a great touch screen and you can adjust some quick um, settings so you have your autofocus settings you can quickly go from single point to tracking and then your um, image quality selection and then your video selection it can record at full HD at 60 fps and then self timer and the on or off the aspect ratio here you have the white balance and then the metering system so that's one thing so whenever you're in uh, the display or the preview mode then also you can have a quick menu where you can protect the image you can have you can rotate the image you can also you know sorry that's favorite and then some of the other things you can also straight away go to menu and you know set up your wi-fi for your phone and then after that you can simply one touch to send your images to those phone you cannot send the videos though and you can quickly have this press this to shift the autofocus system out uh, first format basically and then macro or normal then your flash on this side and iso on this side this button is also important because whenever you're shooting uh, without the EVF, if you want to move the frame, you can simply press that button and move the frame. Now, if you want to come to the center, just keep holding that button and it will come to the center. It's very smooth and it has 31 autofocus points, which almost covers the frame. So that's again a great deal. So you have multiple shooting modes here, the usual P, T, A, M. And then you also have two user modes so you can save your own customized settings maybe you have another settings for your wedding and one settings for maybe wildlife on one settings for landscape anything so you can save up to two of the settings and then also you have some other dedicated stuff but i almost never use it and then you have the movie mode you do not have to necessarily go to the movie mode to start the movie even if you're at any point let's say this one i'm in man move so even if i start if i press this I can start recording but when you go to the movie mode you get some additional benefits some additional settings and those kind of stuff yeah so that's overall the user interface i love the user interface of this camera by the way now talking about the performance the color reproduction is great and not over saturated at any color palette the saturation and hue are proper and natural. The dynamic range is good but not great, you know, after all it's a one in sensor and can't give the mass massively versatile dynamic range of a full frame or even an APS-C sensor of your entry level DSLR, maybe of the same price range. We were hard pressed to find any distortion at 24mm, middle or even at 600mm. At times I thought I saw a bit of barrel distortion at 24mm in the middle of the frame uh, where it's most likely to form but again it goes 
the next moment. Or maybe I was looking too hard. There is a bit of chromatic aberration seen both at the widest and the telephoto ends, but uh, not something uncomfortable. We love the ISO performance of the G3X specifically uh, in regards of a one inch sensor. The processed JPEG images are absolutely fine till ISO 800. The 1600, uh, at 1600, the details start to get deteriorated. 6400 and beyond are pretty unusual. Overall, we like the quality of the G3X, but the limitation of the one in sensors remain. So then, do you like the Canon PowerShot G3X? Do you think you should get this camera over uh, the Panasonic FZ1000 or the Sony RX10? Uh, I, I would tell you when you should get this camera. I'll tell you when you should not get this camera. And in here, we, we, we won't talk general because there are too many scopes when we talk in general whether you should buy this camera or not. I'll mainly talk about whether you should get this camera or not in perspective of a premium uh, large sensor zoom camera and specifically in comparison to the Panasonic and uh, the Sony one. If you want the maximum reach, let's say if, you, if you're shooting wildlife or bird, for example, none of the Panasonic or the Sony will give you as much of a reach at almost the same price. They are hundred two hundred dollars difference between you know among all the three. So let's forget that just for a bit because we can pay that much premium or that less whatever. Uh, if you want the maximum zoom, then you you have to get this camera. It you cannot replace it. Twenty four is a very wide. Uh, angle so that's great even for landscape for architecture you know for street photography you have the 35 mm part for three uh, street photography the 8500 mm part for almost portrait although you won't get that shallow or depth of field because um you know you, the max aperture is not much basically but you you know you'd get the maximum zoom range so it's particularly useful uh, for shooting small subjects uh, like you know wildlife which are at a distance but if you want a very fast lens throughout then the sony rx10 now the panasonic fz100 actually kind of fits in between so if you do not want that much of a reach if you're not shooting let's say bird and you're shooting let's say large mammals mostly so you might not need the 600 mm reach at that time, you can possibly go for the Panasonic FG1000 because that gave you at least up to 4000 mm reach, but it has a max of max aperture of f by 4 at 400, whether this guy has max aperture of 5.6 at 400. So at 400, you have almost one stop advantage there with the Panasonic FG1000. So in that case, I definitely, um, you know, would tell you that you should go with the Panasonic. Sorry for the light. Uh, another thing is that this is weather sealing the Panasonic is not weather sealing at all the RX10 is well weather sealing but this is completely weather sealing this guy does not shoot 4k <laughs> that's one of the main disadvantages of this Canon and Nikon when will you get to 4k the Sony one and the Panasonic one obviously being the premier players of 4k already shoot 4k out of the box the Sony RX10 too also have some amazing features like your a 960 fps um, you know slow motion mode it has up to half an hour of 4k recording and those kind of stuff it's it's amazing this guy does not shoot 4k this guy also is more compact much more compact than the panasonic and the sony mainly cards see that absence of evf and a lens which has a more zoom range but uh, you know not much of a fast lens so if you have those you have already seen our performance review so combining all this you can i hope take a um, informative decision on whether you should go with this one or with the sony rx10 or the panasonic fg1000 i hope i helped you make a decision if you like this video please hit the like button ask anything related to this camera and we'll try to answer them all and please subscribe to our channel and share this video to share the love thank you